Hey there, Dango Stu here. Today's video is about pushing on with the hull, removing some asbestos, and starting a bit of a fire. Bulk of this week is going to be just lots more hull work. So, grinding this off. Somebody suggested doing line heating or using heat to try and pop this out. I think I will give that a go. I think by heating a bit of a ring here, it tries to expand, it can't go anywhere, so it then sort of stays, then as it cools, it'll shrink a bit more. So I'm hoping I can get that to come out, otherwise I'll also have to tap it from the inside. But beyond that, just been doing more pad welding in places. This section here was a bit low, so I just did lots of beads along and I've ground it back a little bit just to try and fill it. A bit ugly now, but by the time it's ground a bit more and then has the fairing compound over the top, I think it was much better than putting a huge bog of epoxy or something that would just fall off. This weld starts to get a bit porous that comes up here too. Both these do, and then a bit of pitting on the chine here, so I'm just gonna put some more weld here as well. So this one was actually quite deep, this, the, the, you know, the pitting in this old weld. So I did a run up, yeah, a little bit dodgy on the way up, just to sort of fill the bulk of it. And now I'm just doing a bit of a Z weave top cap over the top of that. So I think between the two of them should make that seem much stronger than it was. Yeah, it's not going too badly. This I've been keeping the temperature quite low. This is a 2.5 mil rod and I've got the welder on 50 amps. I've got it pretty low. It seems to build quite a lot of heat into the metal as you go and if you have it much higher, it just starts to sag more whereas this keeps it reasonably low. People were giving me stick last time I drank Forex but there's two big advantages to Forex on the worksite. One is you don't have to remember to bring water, and the other is if you knock it over, no one can go, mm, that was a waste of good beer. With the pad welding, I have been doing lots of kind of like a run, chip off the slag, do another run, chip off the slag. But I'm finding, even if I just do a big wad like this and clean it off, there's actually not much in trap slag at all, so it's actually quite quick to patch even quite a large divot. By the time I grind that, you know, and then obviously put a little bit of the epoxy fairing compound, it's fine. Getting back into the 3.2 millimeter rods for this big depression on the keel. The trick with the pad welding I've found is just find a rod that's sort of comparable to the depth you've got because it really minimizes the grinding. Between the 2, 2.5 and 3.2s, I can get to the point where really all I'm doing is sort of knocking the crests off. I particularly like these 3.2s though because they just the slag just falls off them. They're really quite nice to use. So anyway, it's getting there. This is actually the end of the starboard side. That's a milestone. So give it a grind. See if there's any really low spots. Like here it seems quite low still. Here it's high and here it's high because that's where there was a bolt hole, so I was just trying to fill the bolt hole with metal. But we'll give it a hit with the grinder now. Possibly leave it, possibly add some more in these low spots. Now I'm just going to do some of the tiny little 2 mil rods, fill a few of the gaps, and then consider that good enough for the epoxy fairing compound. Oops. Managed to set fire to the uh, woodwork in the cabin. Oh well, live and learn. I'm not worried in that uh, I don't want this section actually. I was going to take it out so you could lean back in bed a little bit and just have the one at the other end. But uh, that's not so much the point, it's more the risk. I've been mean, had the whole thing go up in flames, so anyway, I'll push on taking it out and be a little bit more careful next time. Then again, who am I kidding? 
I'm not going to be more careful next time. I never am. It's not in my nature. So interestingly, before my little fire, I'd been trying to get this unit out. And eventually I kind of gave up because there are all these little nuts that I don't have the right socket for. And then on top here, they're all flathead screws. And I just couldn't get a lot of them out. So obviously I'm going to have to continue trying, even if it means sort of breaking this up. I now have this number of uh, nuts and screws out. That's as many as I can find. I've probably taken more of the nuts off actually. And no single part of this is budging yet. It's actually all glued and screwed, so it's really hard to get out. Hence why I sort of gave up the first time. So I'm moving up to lump hammer and pinch bar. <laughs> Just see if we can tear it apart. Lump hammer is an excellent tool for removing carpet. And behind the carpet are the heads to a whole other set of bolts holding this on that go onto some steel here. They've got that really odd sized nut on the end and once again flat heads here so I think I'm just going to break the timber away from it and then I might even just cut those off the steel. So here's a classic example of what's going on here. This timber frame is bolted to the metal frame here, the heads here, then there was the plywood going over the top which is glued and screwed to the frame. So you literally have to break it to undo the frame to get in here. There's no way to have ever done an inspection, you know, for rust, no way to have, uh, you know, if there was a leak at sea and you started seeing water coming out of here to quickly get in and repair it or anything like that. I think this is a bit of a, a shocker of a design. I'm starting to feel not so bad about having given up on removing it. I did actually put about an hour into this before the fire and after much colourful language went fine, stay. I never want to see another flathead screw as long as I live. Uh, where's my big screwdriver? Here it is. Yeah, nice. So you can see, you know, the quality of the welds in the boat are fine. All the welding for the uh, frame for this thing is really dodgy. So obviously someone's come along and just added this afterwards and used a terrible design. Because you need to get behind bits of furniture in a boat like this, both regularly for inspections to check for rust and should water start coming from behind it, you need to be able to pull it out. I'm going to put something here, uh, different design, so I'm happy. I was actually going to remove it anyway, so that's okay. Um, not that that's an excuse for taking the risk of having a bigger fire, so that was bad, you know, I get that. What I'm going to do though is build something that has its own integral strength as a unit, but then kind of clips in at the bottom maybe, and then has a couple of wing nuts, so it's even like a quick toolless removal. I think that's the way I want to go. It'll be strong. You don't want it to rattle, I get it, you know, I can see why people, you know, glue and screw and try to reduce all the rattles underway. But I just think you need to be able to remove units like this quickly in an emergency. And, you know, there actually, as far as I can see, there is no way to remove this without breaking it, you know, tearing it apart. Anyway, so I'm going to cut this metal frame out because I don't want it. I want to be able to lean further back in here. And then I'm going to clean up the steel and get ready to reprime it. Also, there's electrical cable behind here. If ever there was a fault, you know, mouse got in there and chewed the wires or whatever, you know, how would you get to it? You couldn't. Interestingly, this welding here is the doubler that was added onto the side, so that was already there, done in situ. And it's only because the welding I did along here came and this is where the plywood 
touched it. Oh, that's right. Now I remember. It's actually one of my discs. I could see the plywood through it. And uh, I could see it was smouldering through the hole before I put the disc in. And I thought, I've got to take it out so I can weld the inside of the disc. That's another job to do. But I thought, look, you know, it's only smouldering. It'll go out. It never actually flamed. It just kept smouldering until it went out, but spread quite away. So, clean up. Weld this disc continuously all the way around, then we'll clean up and paint. Gonna celebrate getting that cupboard out with a Bundy, which reminds me to say thank you to Project Brewpeg for their shout out the other day. Jess and Damien are doing up a much larger steel trawler, about 57 foot I think, up in Bundaberg in Queensland. When I first started doing this project, a lot of people said, oh, have you checked out the Brewpeg YouTube channel? And I hadn't, so it was great to sort of be put onto that channel and check it out. So if you have seen this channel and not that one, be sure to take a look because if you like this, you'll love that. My plan when I get back in the water, I'll probably do a bit of work on the water, get a few things sorted out. My plan is to actually head up to the hard stand where Brewpeg is so I can use the sandblasting booth there to do the top sides. Although I intend to get the whole superstructure and top sides of the boat sandblasted up in Bundaberg so I can paint it properly, I am going to sort of manually get the paint off the transom here so that I can get a name on the boat before I go. I think it's important to have the boat be identifiable, you know, so when you do your radio calls or you're in trouble or whatever, people can go, yep, that's the boat we're looking for. I started by painting some paint stripper on, then I gave that a fair scrape and then I've just sort of hit it with a bit of a disc just to grind it off. I had a tarp down here which I've taken away, a few little scraps, but then vacuumed up. Now I'm going to get a 40 grit random orbital, try and clean it up and I might talk to Dave from Altex again about some of that special primer for non-sandblasted surfaces just see if we can get it to really key in. It'll be interesting to compare how well this weathers and how it looks compared to the rest of the boat which will be sandblasted. Speaking of these things I'm going to be wet blasting the engine bay though as much as I can there's plenty of places where I'm not gonna be able to get the wet blaster at the right angle to get to it but I'll do as much as I can. Before I can do that though, I need to seal up the fuel tanks so that the wet blasting doesn't go into the fuel tanks. What I'm gonna do now then is go in there, I'm gonna weld up the cuts in the starboard fuel tank, then I'm going to clean up the inspection hatches, make some gaskets, pop those back on. Ah, actually what I will do first is something I probably should have done a long time ago, which is remove this suspected asbestos from the exhaust pipe inside the engine bay. I'll just get that out, it means I can also then remove the exhaust manifold itself, give myself even more room. There's not a lot to remove, but I'm going to try and do it reasonably, properly, so you know. So I got myself a way sexy pair of disposable overalls. The ones I got didn't say they were for asbestos, but there were other ones that said they definitely weren't, so I just avoided those ones. I spoke to a mate of mine, Andy, who works in asbestos removal. The motto for their company is we do as best as we can, so they've got to know this stuff. He was saying, get some PVA, put it in a spray container, so one part PVA, 20 parts water, give it a really good shake. Then you can just keep spraying it as a way of sort of wetting it and sealing it as you go. I'll obviously have my mask with the respirator, gloves. You can put plastic bags over your boots or those sort of special, you know, disposable shoe covers, that kind of thing if you want. Then he said you need plastic that is uh, 20 microns thick in order to dispose of asbestos. I'll probably organise to dump it in a load when he next goes and does a commercial lot sort of thing, but look up your various council disposal areas, they'll tell you whether they take asbestos or not. Put the PVA in here. Yeah, I reckon about yay amount. I'll fill the rest with water, give it a good shake, and I'll show you what we're removing. What I'm gonna do is cut some of that 20 micron plastic just in a sheet to put under the area I'm working in. That way I can kind of peel it off, just let it drop down onto the plastic, wrap it up, and then we'll double bag it.
Drupal bagged, overalls, gloves, it's all inside there. What I'm also going to do actually, now I think about it, is take the filters out of this mask and pop new ones in now and dispose of the old ones. Should have done that, put them in the bag, but I'll get some gloves and chuck those in as well, put new filters, and then we're done. It's going to get quite fumy in the fuel tank when I'm welding in there because you've actually got to get like past your elbow, like kind of into the tank to, to reach it properly. So what I'm going to do is just take the filler cap off here. This filler goes pretty much down directly above where I'm welding. So I'll just put the vacuum on it and wedge it in so it can't fall off. Let's do it. in the workshop now so we can start making some new gaskets up for sealing these fuel tank inspection hatches. While we're here too, the bottom section of the rudder post starting to look really good now. It's getting that kind of metallic look to it so it won't be long and that'll be ready to paint as well. For better or for worse, rather than using a liquid gasket, I'm going to try making a gasket out of a sheet of rubber like this. This is 3mm nitrile rubber, maybe a little bit thick, probably could have gone 2mm, we'll see what happens. It might leak. I'm going to give it a bit of spray with something like Hylomar just to give it a little bit of stick as well, something that's fuel safe. What I'm going to do however to give it the best possible chance of not leaking is put the inspection hatch back on and then starting in the middle, I'm gonna torque it from the inside as a spiral outwards in about three phases of torque settings, just to make sure that the inspection hatch doesn't sort of bubble and have one area where it leaks. My thinking is I wanna have something that's easy to open again in the future, rather than something that's really stuck on. Look, I'll give it a go, you know. What's the worst that can happen? I'll test it. If it leaks, I'll use some sort of goo. This roll of nitrile was less than a tube of Loctite Master Gasket to give you an idea and I'll easily get both inspection hatches out of it and from the centre bits I'll be able to do all the gaskets for all my um, uh, seacocks and that kind of thing as well so this should do every gasket I need to make so pretty good value in the scheme of things what I'm going to do to start with is mark every single hole and then I'm going to take those holes out with a wad punch then we'll go round and trace the outside and cut that out wasn't too hard in the end. Oh, I forgot to mention, I got some tools sent to me by Malcolm up in Queensland. So thank you very much, Malcolm. I ended up using the scraper he sent me and actually the lump hammer because the other one's at the boat. I used the lump hammer with the 
wad punch because obviously three mil nitrile is much harder to punch through than a normal paper gasket, but wasn't too bad in the end. Of course I found a white pen once I'd finished marking the whole thing in black, but anyway. I'm not going to cut the centre out of this yet. I'm going to have a think about it because, to be honest with you, I can't see why I need to. I really can't. I could actually put a surface adhesive and just stick the whole thing onto the hatch and leave it there. That way there's only one edge you can link past instead of two. I've got plenty of the nitrile, plenty to do both hatches and all the uh, seacocks without using the centres, so I think I'm going to leave it as is. Okay, it's now Saturday morning. I'm not going to get out to the boat to put these in until next week, so we'll leave it here. Uh, one other thing I should mention is somebody commented on a video the other day that I should take the old piece of the keel I cut out and fashion it into some sort of ceremonial dagger to attack pirates that attempt to board the boat. I mean, really? There's someone else who thinks like me? Alright, well take care. Thanks again Malcolm for the tools, really appreciate that, and I'll catch you all next week. See ya.